Kia ora, uh, ko Hori Grover tako ingoa, uh, no te whanganui e tara hau, uh, no te waipona mu tako whanau, um, ko Peritania te iwi, Ngāti Pākia. Um, thanks for coming to this kind of odd sounding talk. Um, it's really about the way people talk about technology and what that means. I'm just going to move over here because I'm going to use my notes a bit as I tend to go off on tangents if I don't and I won't stick to time. Um, so this is a topic that's fascinated me for quite a long time. Um, my undergrad was in communications. I've done marketing for a tech company. I spent three years at Auckland Museum um, in the digital team and I've been to this conference a few times as well as many others which all got me thinking about the sort of rhetoric around technology. Um, and I recently completed a Master of Design. The past three months after that, I've been at Lightning Lab GovTech, which is like an accelerator program that applies lean methodologies and to uh, gnarly government problems. Um, so that's kind of where I'm coming from with this talk. Um, so, so yeah, this presentation is about the stories we tell around technology, but it's less about these kind of specific stories or like the hot takes, it's more kind of about the underlying narratives that form our beliefs and frame how we think about and use tech, um, specifically in English speaking Western context. Um, this is a ridiculously huge topic for 25 minutes um, and what I'm actually presenting is really a bastardised version of like a small section of my master's thesis. Um, which was all about critiquing and creating narratives around emerging technologies. And it's been quite a hard exercise cutting it down, so I hope it makes sense. Um, and I'll try to leave some time for um, questions at the end for anything I didn't explain so well. So I'm going to start by looking at the dominant Silicon Valley story of technology and why that matters and how that's really starting to fall apart. Um, and then I'm kind of going to be finishing by really asking you some questions as well about what this might mean for the glam sector also, during this talk, when I say technology or tech, I'm really talking about emerging digital technologies and how they integrate both into older tech and, uh, and our life. So kind of all this, all this stuff up here. Um, right. So why are, we, why are we looking at the Silicon Valley story? Um, this is a quote from Dr. Jess Berenson Shaw, who's a great communications researcher um, from here in New Zealand. And it's important that we um, look at these dominant stories because understanding these narratives is key to helping create the conditions for people to see a new or maybe less dominant story. So what is the Silicon Valley story? Acknowledging there are lots of other ways to think about tech. Um, I'm looking there because it's the physical or, or at least the ideological home of the people who um, make, fund and design dominant technology platforms. So. And you'll probably all recognise this and you'll have, you'll see it and you'll know that there's stuff wrong with it. Um, but in the Silicon Valley story, technological progress is inevitable, natural, apolitical and most of all it's good. Technology is seen as a value neutral tool, yet somewhat paradoxically, as Mark Zuckerberg once said, a force for good in democracy. The people who design and make technology have no ethical responsibilities for how it's used. They're simply, they're simply codifying the existing world into an instrument or tool. Negative consequences such as job losses are necessary and temporary side effects of disruption and technology will of course solve all these problems in the steps toward a better world. And this is really exemplified in the singularity movement, so the belief there is that there's this need to accelerate technological disruption and progress to the point where humans become kind of integrated with AI, like the singularity, creating these super intelligent near immortal beings. And this, this is kind of the central character in, in this story, this, the Anthropos, the ultimate self-creator who can use technology to solve all of the world's problems. Now, many commentators have described singularity as having kind of a theological hold on technology creators in Silicon Valley, like there's this underlying belief that the world is knowable, that everything can be computed and made into an algorithm. And this quite like theological framing is echoed by others who argue that even outside of singularity thinking, there's like this widely held faith that technology, tech companies and computation will solve all the world's problems. And these um, beliefs kind of form a cohesive narrative Tech is a solution to all our problems because any tech tools and solutions are inherently neutral. 
everything can be computed, so represented as numbers, algorithms, code, which means that number one, technology, technology is a solution to all our problems. You can kind of put it in a loop that just goes round like this and it kind of keeps, it becomes a, a coherent narrative. Um, and Berryson Store describes um, that when you have a, a narrative like this, it's difficult to dispute by pulling it apart because I quote, it's easier to reject a single piece of data than to change the entire story. New stories then are a necessary tool. So I'm going to focus on how the story's really crumbled. Specifically this part, tech is neutral, because this is what um, really changed in 2016, and it shows how the Silicon Valley story is used and why the frames we have and the way we talk about tech really matters. Specifically, there's this myth of platform neutrality, right? Platforms being social network or tech infrastructure. Um, and this means that problems with technology are problems with the use and abuse of technology, not the platform itself. So if you ask a tech company to deal with issues like fake news, addictive services, hate speech, the response was, well, we're just a neutral platform. It's not up to us to control people or police what they say on our platforms. That would be, of course, restricting freedom of speech, another great kind of American and Western ideal. Now, these two events really put a dent in any idea that technology was neutral. Um, it made that story really hard to believe. And I'm not going to go into details because it's quite a well told story. Like, who's seen The Great Hack on Netflix? Yeah, so quite a few people, and I'm sure you've read articles about what's happened here. Um, so basically, many people came to blame uh, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica for enabling and allowing undemocratic or manipulative actions through things like hyper-targeted advertising and mining the data of their users. Um, and obviously it wasn't just Facebook that single-handedly caused Brexit or got Trump elected. Um, there's, you know, nationalism, populism has been on the rise due to a whole raft of things happening. Um, but this, it's significant because what we saw is this kind of hands-off, it's not our fault, neutral approach of tech companies really just backfired on them. And now all these companies are kind of implicated in this what's this worldwide undermining of democracy. Um, so the world is flawed and fairly or not, tech titans are increasingly being blamed. Um, tech giants and their technologies have been increasingly pulled into the middle of these highly politicized debates and all these perceptions of neutrality have just fallen, fallen down, crumbled. And that's quite a significant shift in that dominant, dominant narrative. Um, and it's coming from all sides of like political debate. This is a Republican senator. Um, you know, so are these platforms instruments of freedom or of control? Are they some kind of ideological weapon? Um, and in the past few years, we've seen so much criticism. Um, we've seen inquiries from governments, citizens, and the media, um, from the European GDPR, the privacy legislation, to the likes of the Christchurch call. So, if Guni Roznov kind of sums this up um, quite well, he says, of all the myths that solidified American hegemony over the past three decades, the myth of technology proved the most potent. I'm missing a full stop there. It recast technology as a natural, neutral force that could erase power imbalances between countries. He, he goes on to say technology was, something, was not something that could be tinkered with or redirected. You could only adapt to it, just like you would adapt to the market. So this is probably an obvious statement for a lot of you here today. I know the sector is very well aware of these arguments, um, but we're seeing this become more obvious in sort of popular media and discussion about technology. There's this growing recognition that it matters who designs, owns, uses, and tells these dominant stories about tech. And it really problematizes this kind of neat loop. Like if you change this tech being political, you then start to ask other questions, things like the bias that you put in when you use deep learning, um, all emerge, who is, this, the, who is technology the solution for in any given instance? Um, when something, and we're even seeing these questions being asked more publicly in Silicon Valley with Google and Amazon employees going on strikes um, based on, you know, they don't agree with the politics of what their companies are doing. Um, and when something is this political, it's harder to have like a single kind of dominant frame for thinking, right? Obviously there are still kind of um, big paradigm trends, but what we're seeing really is that there's no single story that can explain anything. No AI can compute everything. No tech company or nation state can control everything. So 
what happens when we think about tech and its political implications. Um, this is a kind of, this is a political compass tool. It's like a, I don't know if anyone's done the online quiz and you can do some, uh, it tells you where you sit on these kind of, this quadrant, these two scales. Um, and this was done by Venkatesh Rao. So he says, technologies and media. Media have messages. Large scale, multiplayer social technologies have political and ideological messages. And, you know, this is just his perspective. I think it's interesting that you can look at these and you might think, well, where does IoT fit? And we, should, we saw this morning with um, Fari Haora that it can be down there in that kind of libertarian left, do it yourself. Um, space, but also when we think about um, Internet of Things in terms of surveillance, then it can be up here, more in that top right corner. Um, so I think these kind of formats, this quadrant format, is an interesting way of talking about like, where does where do things fit, and where does our technology fit in this? And you can change those axes to be really um, anything you want. So what I'm about to show you next is a much more extreme, bizarre version of these quadrants, uh, hopefully you can read it at the back because it's quite interesting. Uh, can anyone, can you read that much at the back or should I read some stuff out? Okay, I'll read a little bit out. So basically this quadrant is, on, on the top it's got hyperhuman, then it's got unhuman. Um, on these, the, the sexies, it's got acceleration and deacceleration. And up in hyperhuman, we have things like so in hyperhuman and deacceleration, there's things like hyper commodified cocaine capitalism. Um, we move over this way, cybernetic sex slime transcendence. Um, down here, we've got 100% urbanization, some city AI autocracy. I don't even know what half these, these words um, mean. Like someone's obviously put a lot of thought into this and it's, it seemed, reads a bit like a sci-fi, different plots of sci-fi books. Um, and this, is, I, this was found through um, an artist called Joshua Cinterella who writes about these kind of really um, detailed memes um, as part of his work. And the, the format is called 16 Futures. This is another one. And I'm showing you these um, partially because they're just really intense and interesting, um, but, al but also because they show on one level this fragmentation of different futures and the dramatically different roles technology could play in those futures. So crypto capitalist pirate balkanization. Um, like it's just, I, I really don't get a lot of it, but I think it's fascinating that someone's sort of gone to do this. Um, down in the bottom here, we've got three, uh, oh, I can't even say that word. Transhumanism, Mormon Transhumanist Association. Um, so it just shows all these extremes and by playing with these like extremities of time and of technology, what these quadrants really show is that our choices about technology aren't just political, they're cosmological. They reflect our beliefs about how the world works and what our place is within the world and also where technology fits in. Because currently, technology is the ground. Um, this is a quote from Yuk Hui, who's a Chinese computer science and philosopher who argues that the problem today is that technology has become the ground of cultural development. So is it possible to resituate technology in the broader reality? He also says, technology is not anthropologically universal. It is enabled and constrained by particular cosmologies, which go beyond mere functionality or utility. Therefore, there's no one single technology but rather multiple cosmotechnics. So what he means here is that our view of technology depends on the cosmology that we're in, you know, our knowledge, beliefs, our interpretations, the practices of the society of our, or our culture, how we think the world works, how we think the universe works. And his word cosmotechnics he describes as, quote, the unification of the cosmos and the moral through technical activities. So bringing some ethics and morality into the technology. And by techn technical activities, he doesn't just mean like the tech I've been talking about so far, but a much broader definition. He includes like craft making and art making. So this capital T technology can become many technologies. We have to really refuse this capital T tech and start to think about not only politically different technologies, but what might 
cosmologically different technologies look like, which is ridiculously hard to say the least, especially from, from one place in the world. And um, Yoku does say that this is something that's going to take generations. But we also know, and as and has, has been mentioned, um, there are already so many different knowledges in our world today. Um, so there's places we can listen and learn, work, work alongside, speak nearby, as Deb said this morning. Or maybe, um, and I speak especially as like a, a, a settler, like can we just get out of the way and work to dismantle and disprove these dominant narratives and these dominant beliefs to, to make way for other beliefs and other cosmotechnics to, to come through. Um, and I think we saw a really beautiful example of this kind of mahi um, yesterday, working with cosmological differences in the presentation from MCA about working with um, John uh, Maunju. I'm not sure I said that right. Because let's imagine, what if we were to make some kind of anthology of news stories about new technologies, many anthologies made by different people. Um, what would these show about how technologies might fit into our lives, not as the ground, and not just in terms of function or how they're used, but what do they mean like morally or ethically? What's sort of, what's behind them? So let's say maybe each of these were a kind of fable or etiological stories that explain um, why things are the way they are. Now, no single one of these stories would explain how everything works, because as, as we've seen, that's impossible and problematic. Um, but with these fables, with these stories, if we were to read them as a collection, reading many collections, you'd get a sense of how people think the world works and how we situated technology within our world, where we thought it fits. So in the year um, 2200, there might be some kind of library and whose digitization was so good that it survived climate change, the archivist did a great job, and it has a copy of these stories. And maybe the cybernetic sex slime we saw before can take its offspring to this library and read those stories to get a sense of the perceived wisdom of our time, of the early 21st century. So what were the switches in thinkings? What were the lessons that we learnt? What were the sort of our changes in mind and beliefs? Um, what, what are the morals of our technology stories? So back to 2019, um, enough of that. Um, what, what are we learning today? And what stories might Glam Tech contribute to such an anthology? Um, I'm not trying to say that Glam can save the world through telling stories. It's a, mini, um, it's a job for many, many areas, many people. Um, but the sector has a lot to offer. And this is really an open question to you all. I have a few like, hypotheses about how Glam Tech um, has different, is different and has a lot to offer. Um, I also want to note at this point now, we're kind of well away from my thesis research and more into just, um, yeah, hypothesizing based on experience and other readings and thinking about what's happened here today. So I think Glam's really the, People here are really thoughtful and tactical about how we use technology. Um, it gets really placed in context. Like I remember when I first started working at Auckland Museum um, and Nils was in my team and he said he was, it was like some sort of meeting. He's like, oh, actually, you don't need to use technology in this space. And that kind of was like, what? Like, but with a digital team, we have to say use technology. Because um, I'd come from this tech company, and the whole basis of its, of its existence is technology is the solution. You've got to use technology. Um, and I think this sector is very like, kind of wise in that regard. Um, and museums, of course, know all about telling stories and the importance of who tells them, um, the methods used. The, the, the long-term thinking and the time frames of this sector um, are really interesting as well. Like other sectors might have to think about quarters or the next three years of the election cycle or have a lo however long you've got left. Whereas here there's people thinking about oh, 150 years in the past, like how are we gonna keep our archives safe into forever? Um, there's just the scope of time that's, that's quite different. Um, and also the sector is kind of already merging, I guess, physical and digital matter, like we're already, the sector already thinks about the material world, you know, like that's the bread and butter. Um, 
and we all, we're kind of surrounded by material objects in our workplaces. We think about what it means to move between digital and physical matter, um, both in terms of back of house digitization efforts, um, of an online sharing, and even in, in gallery digital experiences, we're thinking about how things relate. Um, and I know other sectors, you know, do these things in different parts, but I just really think this sector is really wise in a lot of the thinking about tech. Um, so yeah, I guess I reckon you should all share your wisdom outside the sector a lot more. Um, maybe you already do this, but you know, maybe like go to a conference or go to a meetup and, and tell people about your projects because they're really fascinating and I think show um, some different ways of thinking about how technology can um, work. So I just want to finish quickly. I tried to make a kind of 16 futures for glam quadrant. Um, because I was going to make memes about like this conference and some of the thinking go that was going on, but it felt kind of hard and it wasn't really that valuable, it wasn't adding. Um, but I did try to kind of extrapolate some thinking into the 16 Futures format. I realise you won't be able to read this at the back. And while I sort of show that up, I'll just maybe add a few caveats. Um, this isn't like the you know, cosmologically different um, future formats that we saw before. It's severely limited by my own worldview and imagination. Um, and I found it really hard to think, well, what should the ends of the scale be? Um, was, it, should it, was it better off being like distributed and localized, um, accessible and accessible? Um, what would be interesting would be to put like post-human at one end and uh, human at the other, kind of like those other ones before did. Um, and the other point I want to make with these is, or even pot plotting things, or maybe just a simpler quadrant with just four different things, um, it's less about saying, no, we have to do this thing up here, than saying, well, what's the mix of the different things we're doing, um, and how can we kind of fit those along some sort of quadrant, maybe? Um, it's just kind of a tool for thinking with, rather than saying, this is right, and that is wrong. And the other thing that I found um, hard was thinking of truly futuristic, low-tech scenarios. Like, I found myself automatically associating high-tech with the future. And I think that actually really reflects, in a sense, just how hard it can be to get away from these really pervasive ideas and beliefs about what technology should do. Um, so I think it's a matter of thinking when you're making decisions or even doing exercises like this can help reveal, like, what are your deep-set kind of beliefs lodged in the back of your head? Um, has that Silicon Valley story kind of snuck in? And is that influencing your thinking in some way? Um, so I know this can feel, feel like a really indulgent exercise, but it's kind of fun. Um, and you can begin to see what your beliefs are, where the gaps are in your beliefs. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. I'm going to try to end with a few questions, but just a few final points. Um, Shout out to Taina Hertzer, um, Sarah Powell, and Adam Moriarty, who all gave me some really helpful feedback and encouragement at various points of this presentation. Um, my references are really unhelpful links that you can't click from there, so you can contact me on Twitter or through the Slack um, that Taina set up, Glam Folk. Um, I'll be on there. I've got a longer explanation of that Silicon Valley stuff in my thesis. Um, it's not too dense. Um, um, yeah, and that's really it. And if anyone would, was interested in like adding to this or contributing or making your own or like co-creating something, I think it could be a really interesting activity. Um, yeah, some of it, for instance, glams as knowledge collecting cyborg species. Like that, I was thinking about the CSI Pukakawa talk and you know mixing that the using digital technology while you're looking at nature. Well, what if we were just to cyborg that scientist glam thing? Um, so. Yeah, there's, there's heaps of ways you can sort of just push stuff to the edge, which is kind of fun and reveals what you think. Um, so yeah, and, and share your wisdom. Share your glam tech stories. Thanks, that's it. Um, we have time for questions. Questions, yeah. Um, any questions or suggestions? Got a couple of minutes. Uh, 
Th thanks, that was a really great talk. There's a lot, a lot to think about. Um, really enjoyable. I, I wondered if you'd considered kind of going the other way. You were talking about going outwards. Um, you know, and I'm thinking about technologies and I was thinking about one of the previous, one of those quadrants and around things like face recognition. You know, we're, we're starting to use that in our photographic collections and trying to like democratise what's used currently in quite a creepy way. Yeah. Um, and I wondered if that, if, if that, if you kind of touched on that stuff, going the other way, taking it back rather than, rather than it becoming monopolised by the creepy stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and that's a great, that's a great topic. And I think that's a great comment. And yeah, I was trying to, I, I think it's something in here, you can see I've got a box up there and maybe that's kind of where that would fit in that blank box about something that's uh, maybe not open, but positive and high tech and a, and a and a good use of that. And what does that look like? Like I, I don't know the answer, but um, I guess that the opposite end. I've got monetized collections on demand with armored drone delivery. So like, <laughs> and again, I, I'm just randomly pulling in political um, stuff here. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think it's just interesting because what what would that be? Uh, yeah, this is a, I don't know, but it's a good it's a good question to be asking. And I did, um, maybe, is anyone else? Uh, I did start thinking a little bit about what, how might you kind of map things you're doing on, on maybe less, less dramatic quadrants and what, would, what gaps would that expose? Who do you need to talk to to like fill those gaps or push your thinking in a different direction? Where, where is your current thinking of tech sitting on these things? Um, it doesn't even have to be about technology. It just, and again, it's kind of saying there's a, it's a continuum, not a binary, kind of like um, Anasuya and Adele were talking about yesterday. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different ways, but yeah, any? I think we have run out of time now. Thank you very much, Holly, that was awesome. Thank you. Thanks.